There have been a lot of frenetic articles published of late in which authors have frothed rapidly about how electric vehicles are terrible for the environment, how they're catastrophic because insert reason with faint shred of truth extrapolated to the extreme here. For a long time these articles complained about how coal power stations that were used to charge EVs were dirty, while conveniently admitting that the same dirty electricity is used to refine oil. Now that EVs environmental superiority compared to the internal combustion engine even when operating off a dirty grid source has been conclusively proven so many times. They're switching tack. These new bad faith straw man arguments almost certainly derive from the same charming gent who was responsible for crafting the tobacco industry's disinformation policies, who incidentally also worked for alcohol producers arguing against drink driving laws, and who's now been hired by the fossil fuel industry. Yes, it really is one man who does a lot of the work on all of these things, and they do rely on the fact that there is a shred of truth in these arguments. Legacy media seems quite content to take these straw men at face value, so today we're going to dive in and talk about the sustainability of the EV transition. But before we dive right into our usual favourite topic, electric vehicles, we need to talk about the elephant in the room. There are currently something in the order of 1.42 billion cars on the road right now, and that number is rising steadily, ripping each and every one of those cars off the road and scrapping them to replace them all with an EV is a pretty lousy plan, although I think it's one that most car makers are starting to come around to. But our transition to cleaner, greener, safer, smarter transportation requires us to look beyond just repeating what we've done before, but now with batteries. Public transport, remote working, shared vehicles, walkable, accessible, equitable cities. And for me, I think finding a way to convert a significant chunk of that existing fleet of gas vehicles, many of which will be end of life by an expensive mechanical failure long before the car's body succumbs to the second law of thermodynamics. All of this needs to be a big chunk of this conversation about how we're going to move around. But for today, today we're going to talk about batteries and motors. So, Let's take a look at Shouty Bob's There Aren't Enough Rare Earth Metals comments, and Fred Actually. Their comments that mining will kill us all. Actually. The first thing to know about rare earth metals, well really the most important thing is, they're not rare. They're actually pretty common. However, unlike some other sought after substances, they don't tend to exist in big lumps, in the rock under the ground. You might find tin or copper or lead in a thick seam running miles down into the ground, a seam which you can follow either by digging a tunnel and extracting them the old school way, or you can use modern strip or open pit mining techniques which make a dirty great hole in the ground and heap large piles of stuff that you don't want elsewhere. Unlike metals like iron, rare earth metals are sprinkled, like seasoning, all over the planet. That's actually where the name comes from, because while there are quite a lot of them, rare earth metals aren't as easy to pull out from one location. To be sure, there are areas with higher concentrations of them. China, for example, has an estimated 44 million tonnes of rare earth metals. Vietnam and Brazil each have around 20 million tonnes. In contrast, the US, despite its vast size, is currently only thought to have about 1.5 million tonnes. But is that a problem for building EVs? Well, if you read the comments on this channel or any of these articles, you'll often hear the naysayers claiming that there aren't enough rare earth metals for EV batteries, which is fundamentally wrong. First up, it's mainly hybrid batteries, not batteries for pure EVs that have significant amounts of rare earth metals like lanthanum in them. The most common lithium ion battery chemistries used in EVs don't have any rare earth metals in them, though the cobalt used in many batteries is a transition metal and not incredibly common. So realistically the quantity of rare earth metals is not a problem for EV batteries, but we'll circle back to batteries in a bit. Rare earth metals such as neodymium and dysprosium are, however, present in some electric vehicle motors. 
In fact, because permanent magnet motors often use rare earth metals, but they perform much more efficiently in normal driving conditions, they've become increasingly popular for mid-segment electric vehicles, and that is a potential concern. It's a problem in numerous ways. As I said, while there's not really a quantity issue, extraction can be a challenge. And because there are limited places where that extraction is occurring in a significant enough volume to supply the demand for making the motors, prices have been volatile and extraction processes have often had little regard for environmental protections. Worse, the ores that contain rare earth metals often contain significant amounts of radioactive material. Separating the rare earth metals from those ores often requires carcinogens like ammonia and strong acids. Some reports suggest that each unit of rare earth metals that's produced requires the production of nearly 2,000 times as much toxic waste. Traditional methods have used leaching ponds for this process, which, as has been demonstrated countless times by the coal industry, is a great way to get pollution thoroughly spread about. Toxic chemicals can leach into groundwater and evaporation can allow dried material to become airborne, leading to horrific pollution. In China, they've also seen leaching ponds that go unmaintained, as mining sites are exhausted, where rainwater washes the pollution into rivers and streams. There are also, very obviously, human rights concerns. Many of the places in which rare earth metals have been found are pretty lax with their worker protections. It's not unusual to see images of workers in pools of highly polluted water or toiling underground or in open quarries with no protection and clearly minimal safety regulations. It's pretty common to see children working in these self-same environments. There's a whole discussion we should have about that, but we won't right now. So is Shouty Bob right? Well, yes and no. Just because that's how we've done things in the past doesn't mean that's how we have to do things in the future. And there are some pretty solid options, some that even help us to sort out the mess left behind by fossil fuel extraction. And we've linked to some of these in the description below because while I'm going to broad brush them here, this is not a chemistry lecture. And I'm an ex-biochemist, not a former chemist. And I wasn't even a good biochemist anyway. So the first and most obvious thing is to eliminate the use of rare earth metals in the motor. The Zoe, a car sadly not available in the US, but very popular in Europe, replaces permanent magnets with a copper wound rotor configuration. BMW's most recent drivetrain eliminated rare earth metals and Audi, for example, used aluminum induction motors in the e-tron. Another option which some automakers have chosen is reducing the amount of rare earth metals in the motors of their hybrids. That's a process that Nissan has used, as has Honda. Obviously, as EVs and PHEVs make up a larger and larger proportion of vehicle sales, that will have limited efficacy, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. But rare earth metals aren't just used in EVs. They're used in electronics and for polishing glass. They're really handy things. They're used in oil refineries, and for a while at least, we're going to need some oil to make medications and materials. So how can we get them without destroying the planet? Well, there's some really promising methods. One is using bacteria. We've long used bacteria to help clean up toxic waste from contaminated sites, and researchers from Harvard's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences reported the development of bacteria-based filters using bacteria isolated from algae that can successfully extract rare earth metals from an acidic solution in a much more efficient, cheaper, and less environmentally damaging way than traditional methods. A second approach demonstrated by Professor Wang from Purdue University uses a substance, in this case ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, or EDTA to its friends, that reversibly binds to the rare earth metals in the ore. Once attached to the metal, it's easier to dissolve the EDTA combined metal into a solvent, then having separated the EDTA combined metal out from the solvent, you can reverse the reaction and you've got some shiny, shiny rare earth metals in a process that's, again, more efficient and cleaner than tipping a bunch of acids in an outside pond. Not only that, but a similar process can be used on the piles and piles of waste generated by historic coal use. 
helping us to manage toxic waste that's already lying around. So the end result is that yes, Fred actually has a point, but there are things we can do about it. Okay, so then we come to the other elephant in the room, lithium. At the moment, EV batteries are based on lithium chemistries. There's several really common types, some with cobalt, which we've talked about before, and some without. And lithium is mainly, at the moment, sourced from Australia and Chile, both of which have large deposits. Unfortunately, those deposits are often located in areas that have fragile ecology, and obviously traditional extraction methods can be very damaging. Hard rock mining using the common open pit methods, then extraction of lithium by roasting, generally requires large quantities of fossil fuels, commonly releasing around 15 tonnes of carbon dioxide for each tonne of lithium extracted. And, as well, it leaves massive scars in the landscapes, and it can completely destroy those fragile ecosystems. It also tends to require large amounts of drinking water, something that's often in short supply in the areas where lithium is found. Extracting lithium from underground brine reservoirs, found in some areas where lithium is common, produces around one third of the carbon dioxide as hard rock mining, but uses two to three times the amount of water. But here again, there are developments which may lead to a cleaner way of extracting it. A new company in Cornwall in the United Kingdom is attempting to commercialise extracting lithium from the geothermal brine circulating in the rock deep below the ground, using near zero emission processes that see lithium rich brine pumped up from deep below the surface. The lithium is extracted using nanofiltration or chemical sieves called ion exchange resins, which extract just the lithium chloride, and then the groundwater is returned. It is not the only company attempting to develop a much more environmentally responsible approach to lithium extraction, however, and various similar approaches are being tried elsewhere with a range of much less polluting alternatives to traditional open pit mining. And this can't come soon enough. The Thacker Pass lithium mine in Nevada in the USA will lead to the destruction of a two square mile area to extract lithium using techniques that will scar the land for eternity. This project, which is intending to extract lithium from one of the largest deposits in the United States, was approved by the Bureau of Land Management without input from the Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone tribe, whose traditional lands are being exploited again. The environmental impact assessment states that hundreds of millions of cubic yards of mining waste will be generated, alongside which it will lower the water table in this high desert region by churning through 3,200 gallons or 12,000 litres per minute. The resulting arsenic contamination of the water under the mine pit could still be there in 300 years time. And you can use all the zero emission digging equipment that you want. That's still wrong. Incidentally, yes, because I'm sure Shouty Bob has already prepared his spiel on diesel mining equipment. Caterpillar are working to build zero emission mining equipment. It's part of a project to build a zero emission graphite mine. Check out their agreement with Nouveau Monde for their project. We'll link to that below. Okay, so we can do getting it out of the ground better, but there's still one thing we haven't talked about, and that's a phrase that I'm very fond of. You can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, and there are limits to our ability to extract materials from the ground. Although, as our cheerful poisoning of vast tracts of land to drag the last few mills of oil out has demonstrated, we will go pretty far in our quest. So the final, and perhaps most important thing, is repair and recycling. We need to push auto manufacturers to improve the repairability of their vehicles. Right to repair should be the default, and we need to make sure that when the batteries have been through second and even third uses, it's worth noting that there is plenty of life left in a car's battery pack, even after it's no longer suitable for automotive use. When they're finally exhausted, and when the motors finally do wear out. All of those components need to be recycled and re-enter the manufacturing process as raw materials. All of this is part of creating the circular economy we'll need to survive long term on a planet with finite resources. And doing so in a way which doesn't make the planet more polluted and damaged than it already is, has to be a vital part of our transition to sustainable transportation. 
That's it for today. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and our other two channels, Transport Evolved Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. We know that while a fair few of you are already subscribed, many more aren't. So go on, hit the bell and help us out. Let us know below what you thought of this video, either down in the comment section or on our Discord server. It's free and we'll leave the link below, but however you choose to do it, Remember, play nice. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right for being our 15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, and Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean U. Ada, and Tezza in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month patron supporters. That's John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylan, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. And of course, you can buy your very own TE swag at our Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me. And as always, Keep evolving.